Okay, thank you very much and welcome. The presentation was just here for a second, but it disappeared. Um, okay, so um, to begin with, um, Huntington's glum predictions of global cultural wars might have failed to materialize on a global scale. But we all know that uh, even within Europe, some countries have almost reached the brink of culture wars of their own, of their internal culture wars, and, and not necessarily the ones that we would think of as the usual suspects. Uh, I have in mind uh, the horrible Brevi killings in Norway, uh, but also uh, the recent riots in the UK or in the neighborhood of Greater Stockholm. Um, these, um, these kind of urban conflicts um, could call, theoretically, for a, being addressed through intercultural mediation. And in fact, uh, there have been, in some cases, either through straightforward social mediation or through, as in the case of Stockholm uh, neighborhood, through mediate, police mediation. However, um, I would argue that it would be a mistake um, to try and uh, burden uh, mediation with exclusively with the role of conflict prevention and resolution. First of all, because um, in the countries that I mentioned, the perception of cultural conflict was not necessarily high, especially in Norway, but also in the UK. There was a general understanding that the, the, the relationships between the different ethnic groups and religion uh, communities present was rather well managed, that there was a more or less stable, cohesive, peaceful uh, coexistence. Well, this was proven wrong at the spark. So if you try to address, um, if you try to say that you need intercultural mediation whenever there is conflict, you actually fail uh, to provide it where it conflict might arise without you being aware of it. And, and we do know that in the north of Europe, uh, mediation is rather less widespread than it is in the south. Um, at the same time, cultural conflict is notoriously difficult to define. Um, very often, cultural conflict is simply uh, an expression uh, or an interpretation of underlying social and political conflict around sharing uh, and distribution of resources and power. <laughs> So if you try and uh, deal with it as, as a implicitly uh, and ultimately cultural conflict, you will um, address uh, the symptom rather than the reasons. So uh, I would argue that it is rather counterproductive often uh, to deal with social and political conflict as if it was simply a cultural conflict. In the next few minutes that I have at my disposal, I will try and explain how the, the paradigm for managing um, diversity at the political level, at the urban level, that has been developed by the Council of Europe and the cities participating in the Intercultural Cities Programme, uh, how that paradigm relates and deals with the, the, the dimension of mediation, what the role of mediation is in the intercultural cities, and also raise some maybe some of the challenges uh, that the mediation is is facing as a, as a new and developing field of action. Um, I would like just to say that I'm really delighted to be in Patras again after my last visit in 2009. Uh, Patras is uh, one of the first pilot cities that joined intercultural cities. Patras actually helped to develop the theoretical model and the practice of intercultural integration. And I must say it's one of the cities that has done the most spectacular progress uh, since uh, the since 2008 when they joined and they have become now a model not only within Greece but also in many respects uh, in Europe. So I'm really delighted to be here and I'm, I'm really happy that the leadership uh, the, of the municipality as well as the university and the local uh, NGOs have been very committed to that agenda and have made it uh, have made that political commitment happen uh, in practice. Oops. I need to change the slide. So, oops, the rationale, I am trying to juggle here with this. <laughs> so the rationale for um, intercultural integration or intercultural mediation in cities. Um, wait, I'm missing my points. Oh, no, sorry, 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 sorry. 
Okay. Yeah. Okay, I'll drop this. <laughs> Can you go back to my presentation? <laughs> <clears throat> okay, sorry for that. Uh, just a few words about the inter cultural integration paradigm is uh, within the conceptual framework uh, of the Council of Europe and the member cities. Uh, we have been actually trying to investigate uh, um, and research following a research done by Comedia in the early years 2000 about the different patterns and paradigms of managing diversity in the recent European history across the countries. And we have developed some ideal models or ideal types of policies uh, that have could find in the different European countries. And that matrix defines different models according to the types of rights that they give uh, to the migrant populations. In fact, uh, the progress or the progression of integration policies across Europe has very much been defined in terms of increasing access to rights. In the guest worker situations, uh, which are mostly linked to the German model, but I would say also uh, to the Greek model until recently, um, the, the primary objective of uh, guest workers was to work, but to work for a few years, and then the assumption was that they would go home. So the only rights they would have, and these were usually single workers and mostly single men, although recently with the development of the care and health sector, we also see the, um, the coming of, of single women, uh, they simply had uh, economic rights, they had the right to work. There was no paradigm at all, an assumption of permanence and continuity or a need of integration, therefore there was no intercultural mediation as such. Later on, uh, it became uh, obvious that these people, most of them, uh, will actually stay and settle, and they started having families. They started buying property, or at least trying to, and they started being organized in trade unions. That was also the time very much of, you know, the socialism period, um, workers' rights. So the, the social and economic rights were granted to uh, population groups that had lived in the country for a while. Um, later on, with the coming of the second generation, and this is all, you know, schematic, of course it didn't happen in the same way in all countries, there have been variations and, and mixes, but in a more theoretical perspective with the second generation, the, the, the question of transmitting cultural, cultural heritage became important. Uh, so in some countries, such as the UK, the Netherlands and others, uh, started granting cultural rights uh, to foreigners or to nationalized uh, foreign uh, workers, uh, giving, giving them the right but also the resources and the political authorization to make their culture visible in the public space and to transfer it to the next generations. This was all good, but none of these models really uh, worked on the relationship between uh, migrants and the host community. And this was the biggest gap, and this is still the biggest gap that we still need to address, because you cannot put all the burden of adaptation um, uh, and burden of uh, cohesion to the newcomers uh, without uh, dealing in any way with the way uh, the receiving society is perceiving or reacting uh, to, in, in to, to, the, to the stream of migrants. And this is the kind of issue that intercultural cities, the intercultural integration paradigm is addressing, the need for actively working, catalyzing the integration process also from the perspective of the host community. And in that intercultural paradigm, mediation has a very, very important place. And we work over 60 cities now that are part of the intercultural cities program, both in Europe and beyond. I have for myself categorizing a, a mediation in, in several rough types. Uh, first of all, of course, is as all society. In whenever in the past, uh, community having encountered or people of different cultures have met, there have been merchants or missionaries or other people that have links to cultures uh, uh, and navigate 
uh, the interaction towards a positive outcome. And this kind of informal mediation exists, of course, today in our society. In virtually all the cities that are members of the Intercultural Cities Network, there are examples of civil society organizations, citizens group, or sometimes projects of the local authority itself that encourage individuals from one community to relate actively and to serve as an interpreter to other groups as to the cultural and, and social norms within that community. I can mention, for instance, a recent scheme in Copenhagen where citizens of the whole society could, including deputy mayor for integration actually, has opted to become, as a volunteer, a guide to newcomers that explains Copenhagen way of life and norms to, um, to, to, to migrants, to recent migrants. But there are also other more informal ways of mediation that are not as, if you want, as focused uh, as a welcoming gesture. For instance, I'm thinking of a project in Delft in the Netherlands where a group of Muslim young people, I think Moroccan, organized um, the Ramadan celebration, uh, the feast breaking, the, the sorry, the, the, the fast breaking celebration uh, of the Ramadan in a retirement home for local native uh, Dutch ladies, thereby breaking down the, the stereotypes and perceptions of Islam and creating bridges, creating trust, creating uh, interpersonal direct relations that help to mediate the relationship between uh, the religi different religious groups. So these kind of projects and activities, which I would call mediation, although they are not so standardized and, and defined, uh, they exist everywhere. But obviously, they are not sufficient. Uh, there is a need, and corporate or institutional kind of mediation has developed increasingly within the schools. Of course, the uh, hospital environment was the first because for the need of, of efficiency and treating people effectively really needed to have linguistic and cultural mediation. And increasingly in schools and in, in social services, uh, mediation is being used. Uh, it also corresponds to a trend, I think more general trend in our uh, contemporary society to use mediation. You have legal mediation, you have cultural mediation and, and to, to interpret contemporary art to the lay people. Uh, you have family mediation, so there's a general trend to use that kind of technique um, within the institutions. And institutions themselves have developed now a capacity uh, yeah, I'm thinking of schools, uh, but I'm also thinking, for instance, of police later on. Uh, Monica Dees from uh, Lisbon will tell you how the Lisbon police is uh, using mediation. So this kind of corporate or institutional mediation is slightly becoming more and more the norm. And finally, there is kind of mediation which I call street or neighborhood mediation, which is serves the purpose of more generally uh, addressing the everyday situations that people experience and that are outside of institutional scope. And there's an interesting example from a small Spanish city called Vic, where a couple of years ago, it's only 40,000 people, but they had six full-time uh, employees who were uh, walking around the streets and the neighborhoods and talking to people about everyday experiences. So the elderly ladies that were afraid of the, of the youngsters hanging out on the square or they were complaining about the noise under their windows, they could share their fear and their anxiety with these mediators. And interestingly, when the mediators offered some help, you know, institutional to, to make a complaint, they said 90% of the time the, the, the plaintiff said, oh, no, it's okay. I just needed to share it with somebody. And that actually teaches a, a very important lesson. It is that we don't necessarily always have to work at the underlying structural issues. We, we, we need to address the people's fears and, and mental barriers just by showing that there's somebody who is there to address an issue. Um, I think in the increasingly diverse societies in Europe, um, a lot of the conflict is due to the fact that people are afraid that immigration has gone out of hand, that nobody is taking, is addressing any of, of the problems that it brings. Uh, and when the local authority shows that there is a pilot in the plane, that somebody is actually there, 
to listen and to deal with any problems, then people feel reassured. And very often that kind of reassurance is what is enough to address the, the, the issue of living together. So that kind of mediation is useful and it is there. It has to be part of the permanent infrastructure of the intercultural city. Um, and finally, I want just to give you an example about um, a more a mediation project that addresses more generally the, the stereotypes that people have about migrants. So it's not about specific people and situation, it's more general how do we relate to those people from different cultures. It's called Migrantes and it was in a project in Germany where the migrant women were asked to draw, express in drawings, the everyday situation where they felt they were discriminated or abused or treated with disrespect. So situations where for instance, they would have higher education, but because they had a job as a cleaner, they were perceived as an uneducated person. So these are transferred by, in, with, by artists into pictograms, not the terrorists. You know, every person with a burqa nowadays could be perceived as a potential terrorist. So these pictograms were then put in public places, in the metro, and they served they served to raise awareness of the public of their own prejudices, of their own deep-lying uh, wrong perceptions of who, who these people in. And um, another project that I would say is broadly speaking, Asian projects, the intercultural couch in Dublin, where people were invited on the street to sit and share their understanding of the diversity in their city, how they live with it, uh, issues it raises, or what potential it has. And this in the context of city, of how it's changed, the urban environment. And this kind of projects are extremely beneficial for, for people to understand and create themselves a new, more pluralistic and identity and understanding of the community they live in and which has changed. Now, how does mediation, all these, these kinds of mediation, have their place in the intercultural city? Um, in, just to maybe in one line to explain the, the key elements of the intercultural city paradigm is that diversity is, has to be seen and has to be dealt with as a resource rather than as a problem. Still very much in our institutions, we tend to to deal with migrants as if we had to fix something in them. You know, they have to fix their skills, we have to fix the way they behave, we have to fix uh, their understanding of the legal system, we have to provide help, we treat them as victims, and this is the kind of implicit and, and spontaneous way in which many, many of the social workers and well-meaning educators and others uh, deal with migrants. Now, in the intercultural city, we try to reverse the perspective and say, what if you approach these people as your first objective was to find what talents they have, what kind of personal experience, what contribution they can make in their environment? How can you help them to realize their potential and to find their right place in society? But there are also other very important dimensions, uh, aspects of the intercultural uh, integration policy. Its objective is to create dynamic interactions between migrants and the whole society. These dynamic interactions are not, they don't happen spontaneously. As here, the colleague from, from Limerick said earlier, it's, you can create a multicultural society easily. When people share the same common space, spontaneously they come together in their kin, group of kinship because they, of course, feel more assured and, uh, and stronger that way. So you, you, need to, you really need to, to create an infrastructure. You have to create models of intervention that create those bridges, that bring people into contact in a positive way, because they also can come into contact in a negative way, in a conflict. So what kind of activities, what kind of institutions do you create? What kind of competences you need uh, to install in the institutional agents so that they're able and their objective is to actually create these dynamic interactions and encourage people to co-create. Finally, three minutes. Okay, finally, the intercultural cities paradigm is about power sharing. 
And here I would like to come to the to the mediation, the role of mediation. If if mediation only tries to help people and fix their needs or respond to their needs, it might actually strengthen rather than uh, uh, rather than eradicate this underlying power asymmetry that exists still between migrants and and host society. It might actually help to to oscillate it rather than diffuse it. So it's very important uh, for the mediators to be aware of that challenge. Just want to show you that one of the tools that we have in the Intercultural Cities Index mediation is uh, one of the several um, important uh, indicators. There are three questions that uh, that are they, they address it mediation. And here you see one graph, one chart about the results of the cities, we have now over 65 cities in the index. Uh, the cities, with smaller and bigger, don't seem to have any different approaches to uh, mediation or success. So you see it's a bit of a 50% maybe success. However, there is a difference between cities according to the percentage of migrants. So the more they are foreign born in a city, the more cities become aware of the need to put a uh, mediation instrument in place. Coming to the end, what kind of challenges uh, mediators face in an intercultural city, in, in any environment for that? Uh, essentialism and cultural relativism are, I'm sure some other people will talk about later, are, are really important uh, to avoid. And one, and it's, it's important not to lead mediators on their own to try and define what is the place of cultural norms, what's the race of social norms, and what's the place of legal norms, and try to navigate these systems. There has to be an explicit way of defining that for society, so that they simply interpret it rather than try to invent it. Um, it's also important mediation towards empowerment. That's what I said earlier, not treat migrants as victims and ultimately people that need help, but try and realize their potential. Because legal, political, and financial framework are important. If you only have mediators and you don't have any of the other elements of intercultural policy, you're unlikely to achieve results. You may be masking some of the issues, but it's not sustainable in the long term. And of course, if mediators are only people who are the first people to go in a crisis, then you're not serious about it. Finally, mediation should work towards its own eradication. Mediation should be a step in the development of the intercultural city, the ultimate purpose being obviously to have intercultural competence mainstreamed. And one question that I'd like to leave to you, and maybe we'll have an opportunity to talk, to, to talk about it during that conference, is that can mediators go beyond um, conflict? Can they go beyond uh, helping people to find their place in society? Can mediators become a real agents of diversity advantage? The diversity advantage is a key concept for the intercultural city. How do we use the diverse skills, experiences, and perspectives to create new products, to create new economic dynamics, to create better policies? Because mediators link to both newcomers and the host community institutions, they're really well placed to create these opportunities for that uh, exchange that leads to these innovation. Common that most of them don't have that as a job description and they don't have it as a perspective either. So would it be possible to encourage mediators to take up that role? I would call it more of a catalyst of diversity advantage. Uh, I think we really need it and I don't see who else for the moment could become that kind of skilled, trained, active agent of, uh, of diversity advantage. Okay.